Welcome back to the Student Hub Live STEM Showcase. Well, now we're going to talk about the new maths and its learning curriculum. I'm joined by Rebecca Rosenberg, who is a lecturer in maths education, um, and also Kathy Smith, who is the qualifications lead um, for the degree maths and its learning. So welcome today. I know lots of you at home are interested in this particular session. We've made it very interactive. Let me just remind you about some of these word clouds that you will see on your screen. We've been asking you um, about three of the things that your best teachers did at school to inspire you. Now these word clouds, as I've mentioned before, for those of you who were here at the start of the show, um, need three things. But if you can only think of one or two, that's absolutely fine. You do though need to put a full stop in the box, otherwise your results won't submit. So tell us what some of the things are that your best teachers did at school to inspire you. Um, and no names because of data protection, but some of the worst things that you remember um, about a teacher. Okay, so fill those in in the boxes. Um, so welcome, um, Rebecca and Kathy. I began our careers section um, by asking um, our experts uh, from the careers and employability services about whether they were in fact in their dream job. And a lot of them said no. So I'm going to put the same question um, to you. Um, Kathy, did you always want to be a maths teacher? Oh, well, it's my dream job now. But when I was a teenager, um, I wasn't always that good at maths. And I really wanted to be, I wanted to be a lighting designer. I loved theatre. I wanted to point the, point the lights, get the angles, get the shadows. That was, that was where I really saw myself. And, and why this matters to me now is because I went on a course um, to find out about, at a theatre, to find out about being a lighting designer. And it was me and, and four boys. And somebody said to me, you can't be a lighting designer because we haven't got any ladies toilets. And that has just stuck with me because that is not how I want girls today to be feeling about maths and science. I want them to feel that maths and science and anything like that is for them. And so that was one of my passions about my research is that you can do it. And, you know, everybody is at home in maths and science. And that's why. So that's something for me about good maths teaching. Brilliant. Excellent. Gosh, what an I also used to want to do lighting design as well, but not for the same reason. But isn't it isn't it amazing how like times have just changed so dramatically? I don't think you get that now, but but probably lucky for us, Kathy, that uh, they didn't have those toilets in operation at the time. Well, you wouldn't be here today. <laughs> what about you, Rebecca? What what did you want to, to do? Um. Well, when I was really little, I wanted to be a clown, um, which I don't know if that's a sensible career choice. <laughs> and that stopped quite soon um, after I decided. But um, I remember getting really interested in maths when I was doing um, my GCSEs, actually. I'd sort of always kind of liked it and been good at calculating and things, but I never thought that it was amazing. And then um, I just had this really nice teacher who explained things in um, a sort of different way, in a clearer way. And I really liked, I remember the topic that we were doing, it was about sectors of circles. Um, and I just really liked the way that you sort of, you multiply it by the proportion of the angle of a full circle and that gives you the area of the sector and it all just kind of fit and it all worked together and seemed really kind of nice and sort of closed. And I really liked that about maths. And then that's when I started thinking, oh, maybe I could do maths beyond GCSE and do A-level and maybe a degree and, and maybe who knows. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of all worked out like that. Brilliant. Excellent. And, and interesting, I guess, how we end up in those different places by listening to our guts and things that excite and inspire us. We're able to perhaps go in different directions. Well, we asked everyone at home um, about some of the things teachers did to inspire you. And that's really at the heart of today's session, because um, I remember when I was younger at school and in physics, in fact, I'm um, trying to avoid all of the circuits that I couldn't quite manage to do, etc. And my physics teacher said to me, Karen, anybody can learn anything. It just depends how quickly and in what way. And that's always really inspired me because because I thought sometimes if I didn't understand something by reading, I might just need to, to look at things differently. And for me, that's always a sign of, of, a, of a best teacher. But let's see what some of the things you've said um, about things that teachers did to inspire you. So here we go. Some of them are using real life, which is the key thing. Um, people who really love their subject, using praise, interesting topics, um, trying different ways of doing things, making things fun, and having uh, conservation areas, also conversation areas, using positive feedback, not giving up 
up, giving extra information, being approachable, enthusiasm, um, and, and being knowledgeable. Being strict, that's quite an interesting one, actually, as well. Sometimes, um, I know when, when I've been teaching, sometimes I think somebody might want, for example, something that may be not in the best interest for that student. And sometimes it's hard to say, actually, let's just do it now um, and, and get it over and done with. Um, so, so tell us then, um, Cathy, uh, one of the modules is called Mathematical Thinking in Schools. Um, what's the difference then between um, mathematics and, and mathematical thinking? Okay, so we could think of mathematics as being um, what mathematicians and scientists do and they publish in books and they write about at university. But mathematical thinking is what we all of us have the capacity to do to make sense of real life. And even as young children, um, we sometimes say, you know, put on your mathematical glasses and, and see the world through numbers, counting, measuring, um, ordering things. And when, when you work with young children, sometimes there's the curiosity about learning the pattern of counting. Um, it's almost poetic. So that kind of mathematical thinking, that's something all of us can do. Um, and as teachers, that's what we're really interested in, is thinking about all the different ways that people can think mathematically, not just how I get to the end of the problem, but how other people think about maths as well. So teaching is really people focused. It's about how people think, not about what's written on the page. Um, so in our modules we have, we talk about mathematical content. So that's things like, um, do you understand place value? Do you understand angles? But we talk about mathematical processes. So calculating is a process, but defining, explaining, um, classifying, all these things that help you think mathematically and help you think critically and are in all of maths all over the world, um, um, not just in particular topic areas. And then I suppose another thing about mathematical thinking Maybe by the time they've got to us, they've, they've automated their mathematical thinking. They just know they're on a single track to the right answer. They know what to do. But you've got to work it back and think about the steps and where people might go differently and how to make those steps explicit again for other people. Because novices don't think like experts. Children don't think like adults. So you've got to get in touch with the ways that you learnt to do things and not the way you just see how to do it now. Um. Mm. It's interesting. I've been um, homeschooling like many people have um, and, and sort of, uh, you know, the maths has been quite challenging because the way I was taught maths when I was little is very different to the way that it's taught now in schools. And, and one of the things I'd noticed was this notion about, you know, getting the right answer in the right way. And very often my daughter and I would, would sort of use different workings to get there. Is, is something around mathematical thinking that flexibility, Cathy? Yes, I think the... Um... There is an efficient, you know, often the way, the final way we end up, there is an efficient way to do it. But too often people can't start a mathematical problem. So having flexibility is like, well, can you think of a way to start? And if what somebody said about make it fun, make it something you can do. We start counting, we have a go, we get some confidence. And once we've got a few flexible ways of doing it, I mean, draw a diagram, say something out loud. Those things that just get you started and then you can work towards the most efficient method afterwards because efficient and effective is great, but flexibility to help people get started to get over that barrier. Mm. Janice says it's so sad that um, so many people say that they can't do maths and I've heard this so often before and um, particularly when people aren't doing a pure mathematics um, qualification but perhaps maths is implicated somewhere along the way that that's sort of not their core area and there can be these massive fears and anxieties that perhaps are stemmed from our school days let's take a look um, and see what some of the worst things that teachers did are um, because people have been filling them at uh, home and one of the key things here is making me feel stupid and 
I think this is one of the key things that can put people off or when they were bored or shouting or being disengaged. Um, so a lot of these, I think, reminiscent of the way that, that you know, people had taught in, in the past or being sexist there, no experiments, being un, unapproachable, being unprepared, oh, chalk and talk, etc. no praise. So there's something here about teaching that, that's more than just the process for people. And I think that's absolutely right. Um, Rebecca, um, Kathy mentioned before that sometimes people sort of do mathematical thinking. Um, we, we do this in everyday life, I think, was the point you were making earlier. How might that relate to, to this topic now? Um, well, sometimes people engage in mathematical thinking and they don't even realise that they're doing it. And um, one of the things that our modules try to do is help people become aware of when they're thinking mathematically. So um, mathematical thinking in schools, which is ME620, that's got lots of um, activities in that it's not just answer this math question or even how would you teach this to a child or a learner? It's actually looking at how you've approached a, a problem or a question um, and what processes you've gone through, how you've been thinking about it instead of just getting it the final answer um because it's really important to understand your own mathematical thinking so that if you want to help learners sort of realize their the way that they're thinking mathematically as well and help them to communicate what they've actually done um we've actually got a can question. you give us an example then um, yeah yeah we've got an example um so i love Good. any excuse to play with lego so um i've taken my son's lego and i've made this sequence which is um one of the ones that appears in ME620. So anyone who's studying that might have already been familiar with this. Um, so we've got a sequence of patterns um, and you might sort of see, okay, well, I know what the fourth one's gonna look like. Um, but a more interesting question to ask, to sort of explore how you think mathematically is to ask how this sequence is growing. How would you generate the next one? Not just what is it, but how does the sequence increase? So we've got a widget that we'd like you to fill in. It's a multi-choice one. Um, no one knows what response you've put, but have a go. Imagine the pattern growing. What do you see first? Is it the central square, the large square, the four corners or the border? So if you fill that in, then uh, we can take from that. Sorry, Rebecca, I just wanted to give people that prompt to do that. Thanks. So, um, yeah, if you've... If you've um, answered the question you might have um thought about kind of the central square kind of getting bigger each time or maybe you looked at the four corners and and noticed those expanding um or you might have looked at the border or the whole square um everyone notices different things and and that's kind of the point that we were getting at earlier about there's not just a right or wrong way there's lots of different ways of approaching mathematical thinking um and it's kind of the role of the teacher to recognize that and help help learners understand that there's no right way. Mm. And, and as we saw before with some of the things that teachers were doing that was really sort of helpful and unhelpful, it was, you know, saying something was wrong or shouting at people or making people feel bad about things. It's about encouraging and understanding, I think, that's so much more fundamental in terms of, uh, in terms of those responses. So let's see what everyone at home said um, in terms of this question. So here you go. This is our results. We've got the majority of people um, saying that 36% uh, say it would be the border. So. Can you give us some feedback, Rebecca? Um, well, yeah, I mean, that's uh, different to me. So if I was teaching you and I didn't realize that um, everyone thought differently about things, I'd have said, oh, well, this sequence increases um, because the middle square gets bigger by one in each direction each time. And that's how it's in it increases. But because that's how I see it. But that's not the only way, as we can see, everyone's <laughs> said different things. Yeah, no, absolutely. And both are right, aren't they? Yeah, all, all options are right. And I mean, the problem can even be extended. So if you were to say, oh, what would, um, if there was another pattern before this one, so this is the first pattern that we've got, but if there was one sort of over here before that one, what, what would that look like? So work backwards. Um, and that's even, even less well defined, really, because it could be anything. Um, I've got some examples. So maybe if you've been thinking about what that other sequence would look like before that one, it could just be a central dot on its own with no border, if you work backwards, or it could be just the border, or it could just be nothing at all. There's no sequence, because it all depends on how you decide to generate that sequence in place. Um, that kind of impacts what it before. Um, and there is the right answer. 
Mm. So, so what do you think, Rebecca, the most important thing is for people to understand um, about learning maths? Um, well, I, th I think it's just that, actually. Um, if, someone's, if someone wants to um, help someone learn maths, um, alienating them or making them feel like it's, it's not for them is, well, it, it's, it's not going to help. Um, the point about maths being right or wrong like like for me that was I loved it I loved the fact that everything was sort of there in its place and it kind of makes people see, feel safe that there's this sort of set way of seeing maths a lot of people really like that about maths but um for some people they just don't they want the chance to kind of explore and change things and and scribble things out um and maths can be like that as well um as long as we find the right activities Mm. So, so very often, you know, maybe our conception of seeing maths as, as having a right or wrong answer um, isn't quite clear cut. You've got another question um, for us that we'd like um, people to fill at home. Um, so we'd like to know what the name of this shape is. And Rebecca has a shape yep. for us. Remember, with our word okay. clouds, you can only put um, one, two or three things and put a full stop in if you only want to say one name or you can say multiple names as well. So let us know what you think um, the name of this shape is um, and uh, put one or two things in the box in a full stop. And we'll just wait for those um, results right now because I bet there'll be a whole range of different answers coming through for that, Rebecca. Maybe, yeah, although people um, were quite in agreement of the, on the other question, so we'll see what comes up. Brilliant. While we wait for that, Nicola, how's everyone doing back at home? Everyone is doing well. Um, we've got a, quite a comment from Colin about the last um, question that was posed there around the Lego. And the comment was that there's an ir irregular spacing between square one and one stroke two and square two stroke three. Don't know if you want to comment on that. That's a, that's a really good point, actually. Um, when I was um, playing with this Lego, I, I didn't think about the spaces between the shapes. I also didn't think about the colour. A lot of people might have thought that the the sequence generation was to do with the colour because there was kind of green and yellow, but I just used the Lego that my child's got. Um, and yes, absolutely. Sometimes um, with all kinds of learning, things happen and um, there's distractors that might appear to be important to some people that actually the they're not um, something that the person asking the question has thought about. Um, and that, that can happen a lot. So it's important to be aware of that. Thank you for raising that point. Brilliant, okay. no, absolutely. So let's, oh, sorry, Nicola, did you have something else? Yeah, it's just, it's just um, going back to some other comments in the chat box. So Vin we were talking earlier about the fact that maths is taught differently now and, and it can be a challenge as an adult to help your child, if you've got children or young people around you to um, support them with their maths. And Vanessa had commented that actually um, she learned maths in a different country um, and her, her child, her daughter is learning now, learning in the UK. And she's finding that really challenging because it's, it's different to how she learned it as well. Um, and then a few comments around the whole issue of of um, attitudes to maths. So Jennifer is saying that she used to be one of those people who couldn't, she used to say she couldn't do maths, but now she's doing MST124 and she's loving it. And Pascal as well, similarly, um, has commented on the fact that lots of people just, it's a mindset, they think they can't do maths. It's a, an anxiety thing, isn't it? Um, but on a positive side, Janice said she went to an old fashioned grammar school and there, um, pupils were strongly encouraged to, to get involved in maths and, and actually um, enjoy it. They ended up enjoying it because, because it was all about um, changing attitudes. Mm. And we could change attitudes for, for our future generations if we were a lot more positive and sort of applied different ways of thinking. I mean, I think that's something that inspires so many people who want to go into teaching um, to make that difference and be that amazing teacher um, that we remember well into adulthood. Let's take a look, Rebecca, and see what responses people said um, about what shape you were holding up. So here we can say that we've got different answers. Um, we've got diamond, square, rhombus, rectangle, blue box, pentelogram, quadrant, knot, drunken square, uh, rhombus a few times, um, so quadrilateral also. Uh, what is your response um, to, to what our audience think? I love it. So many different, so many different answers. Um, and that's great. Um, lots of people said square. So norm, I, I think if I'd have shown it like this, um, a lot more people would have said a square because that's how we're sort of used to seeing squares um, with the top and the bottom kind of parallel to a computer screen or whatever, a window, whatever we're looking at. Um, a, di a diamond, um, 
not technically a mathematical term, but that doesn't matter because um, we learn the shape of a diamond quite early on at primary school. And um, they're often presented to us like this with the um, sort of top corners and bottom corners um, at the top. Um, but like as I'm turning it around, you can see that the shape isn't changing. So it's a diamond, it's a square. Someone said a rectangle, nice. Um, so actually all um, of those shapes are part of a polygon and you can kind of think of um, classifications of shapes a bit like a Russian doll. I've got a Russian doll here. I love props. Um, so we've got a Russian doll. Let's have a look at the whole, imagine that this is the, all the polygons. So all of the 2D shapes with straight edges. Um, but within that, we've got all of the quadrilaterals. So all of the 2D shapes with four sides. And then within that, all of the parallelograms. I'm not sure if anyone on the word cloud said parallelogram, but it, it, you could have said a parallelogram. Um, and within that, the set of all rhombuses, which is kind of the, the correct mathematical term for a diamond, is what people often call a diamond. Um, and within that, we've got a square. So a square is a special rhombus, a special type of parallelogram, a special type of quadrilateral. And, um, and that's one way of thinking about classifications of shapes. And that just shows that all of those answers were correct as well. Brilliant. Absolutely perfect. OK, so so this sort of logical reasoning, um, I guess, is is important in mathematics, but I can also see it applying in so many different areas. I mean, Jennifer um, used to say that she didn't like studying maths, um, but uh, she realized during S111, which is an interdisciplinary module, um, that she actually really liked it. So she's gone on to progress that. But some of these um, ways of thinking would be very appropriate in business and other contexts. Um, Kathy, um, let's go to you again and, and think about um, some of the most um, favorite topics of yours to teach. Um, what do you like teaching most? Oh, one of the topics I really like teaching at school is simultaneous equations. Um, and I like that because it's like an, it's an algebra topic. It's got X's and Y's and equations and sometimes curly brackets. Um, but and what I really like about it is it's a puzzle. You know, you've got some information and you've got some things you want to know and you're going to use the clues like Sherlock Holmes. Um, you're going to use the bits you do know to end up with the bits you don't know. So I like starting it off like that. Right. Here's we've got some information. Um, how can you make sense of these clues and tell me these things I want to know? And I think Rebecca's got Rebecca's got a little puzzle that um, we can show now, the kind of thing we might do. Brilliant. Okay, Very yeah. briefly, Rebecca, let's look through your, yeah. your final puzzle. OK, so this is um, it's more similar questions that you might think of, of typical maths questions. We've got two cups of coffee. I'm not going to stack them on top of each other because they'll fall. Two cups of coffee and a biscuit cost three pounds. One cup of coffee and a biscuit costs £1.75. What is the cost of a cup of coffee? Brilliant. So we have a word cloud there, but as you know, you probably only have one answer. Although if you have more than one, you're very welcome to put that in. But do put a full stop into that word cloud so that we can see what your response is. So um, two cups of coffee and a biscuit cost three pounds. One coffee and a biscuit is one seventy five. So what is the price of a cup of coffee? Uh, so put a full stop in if you um, don't know or an X in the box uh, if you only want to include one answer. Brilliant. So while we wait for those then, um, I don't know, do, do you two want to sort of uh, show how that relates to the algebra sort of thing we were talking about? Um, yeah, so this is um, a simultaneous equation question like Cathy was talking about. Um, and we've got um, props again, because sometimes that can help you to see how the relationship with the um, between the two uh, variables, the coffee or the biscuit, the relationship between the two objects work together. Um, and if we've got um, what we know the price for two cups of coffee and one biscuit, and we know the price for one cup of coffee and one biscuit, it, sim uh, in common with both of those equations is one cup of coffee and one biscuit. So if we subtract one cup of coffee and one biscuit from um, one of the equations, we can find the price of one thing. 
Brilliant. Now we're just getting the results of those through. These are the sorts of questions though I find getting so increasingly complex in my daughter's homework with uh, all of these sorts of ways of thinking about if so-and-so has these many apples, etc. So let's see what people at home said and um, the answer was to your question. Right, here we go. One pound seventy-five. One to twenty-five even. There we are. Is that the correct answer? That's that is the correct answer. Well done, everyone. Um, this was one question where there is there is a correct answer. But I think um, it's it, once you've got that, there's a lot more things that you could find out from that as well. So you could find the cost of one biscuit, or you could ask different questions, um, all based on that one initial problem. Brilliant. Excellent. Well, that has been absolutely amazing. Sadly, um, that's all we've got time for today. But um, I've really, really enjoyed our discussion. Um, Becca and Kathy, thank you so much for coming on. You're both really inspiring teachers. Um, and it's been really interesting to think about things not necessarily being right or wrong, but the importance of understanding things, listening to people, and also, um, as, as we sort of heard earlier, picking up on clues that are important or not important um, to the area of concern that we're addressing. So thank you so much um, for, for filling us in. We've got some links um, for in the chat no thank you we've got some links thank in the you. chat as well so if you're interested in finding out more um, about maths and its learning then uh, you can uh, certainly have a look at the perspective and see if that's something that's right for you it's something that people who are interested in teaching um, but also uh, can appeal to students on an open qualification who may want to support their children at home also so some very exciting options there for you right we're now going to have um, another video break we're going to show you one of our other campus tours the Jenny Lee building this time um, and then we will be back very shortly afterwards to find out about the new geology curriculum. Stay tuned, see you in a moment.